In a galaxy called Branta, Master Chief John leads his team of Spartans. Urgently evacuate the civilians from this place. This is the third evacuation mission within six months. The indigenous people harbor resentment towards the UNSC. They refuse to cooperate with their actions. While both sides are negotiating, a message suddenly comes from the front. It says that they have tracked down nearby Covenant Invaders Destroyer. Shortly after, communication with the team on the mountaintop is lost. To confirm their safety, John quickly rushes to the mountaintop to check. The mountain is shrouded in fog. The people in the vehicle are nowhere to be found. Just as John is wondering, several gunshots suddenly come from the direction of the fog. Fortunately, they are also members of the Spartan squad. The newcomers tell John, the relay station on the mountaintop is being disrupted. They have lost contact with the outside world. John plans to take them back to the condors. But before they can leave, a soldier is pulled into the dense fog by something unknown. Everyone immediately goes on high alert. Unfortunately, the visibility around them is extremely low. The soldiers haven't found where the enemy is yet. They are dragged into the thick fog one after another. Almost in the blink of an eye, only John remains at the scene. Along with a female soldier named Kate, the two of them nervously observe their surroundings back to back. The smell. It turns out that Covenant's elite warriors are causing trouble. John immediately gears up to counterattack with full force. He overwhelms the elite warrior with a fierce beating. When he regains his senses, he realizes that Kate is missing. John picks up his weapon and surveys the area. He relies on his keen combat instincts, dealing with the continuous onslaught of elite warriors. John exerts all his strength to kill all the ambushers. He continues to search for Kate. Fortunately, she hasn't suffered any fatal injuries. Just then, dozens of elite warriors appear. However, this time they don't attack. Instead, they holster their weapons and vanish into the fog. John sees a blurry figure. Presumably, this person gave the order to retreat. The next moment, a dazzling light engulfs the land. The Covenant keeps emitting rays into the galaxy. They want to completely destroy the homes of the indigenous people. Even escaping transport ships are instantly destroyed. John quickly carries Kate and leaves. The once prosperous galaxy is about to be destroyed. Some indigenous people who have lived here for generations choose to stay and face the fate of their homeland. John silently watches their departing figures for a long time. After the Spartan squad returns to headquarters, the general convenes a meeting to explain the current situation. Several colonial planets within the UNSC have all suffered glassing attacks from the Covenant. But John feels that this time is different. Even before the Branta system was glassed, Covenant's elite forces had already landed. This simply doesn't make sense. If Covenant's plan was to glass the colonial planets, why bother sending troops for the initial invasion? The general suggests reporting this doubt to the ONI. John wants to argue a few more points. Suddenly, a stranger bursts in. This person is named Carter. He will take over DR Catherine's work in the future, becoming the new leader of the Spartan program, including John. The members of the Silver Team are confused. Obviously, no one has informed them. In fact, after the memory awakening of the Silver Team members, they have already lost the trust of the higher-ups. They have even been marginalized. So, for the past six months, they haven't taken on any major missions, and this Carter is supposedly the new leader. In reality, he is a spy inserted by the higher-ups. John understands this, but this mission makes him uneasy. So, John still chooses to remind Carter, Covenant would never randomly attack a communications relay station. There must be a bigger conspiracy behind it. Unfortunately, the latter doesn't appreciate it. He even credits all the achievements to Kate. Carter, in order to suppress John, deliberately assigns the Silver Team's mission to the Cobalt Team. The once influential Master Chief can only stay at the base and handle logistics. John goes to confront Carter. He believes Carter shouldn't conceal things from the outside. The incident of the elite soldiers destroying the relay station. The Cobalt Team, who is completely unaware, they are about to depart for the next relay station. What if they are ambushed due to inadequate preparation? However, Carter ignores John's warning. He even questions how John managed to escape from dozens of elites. John explains that the enemy disappeared on their own. But how many people would believe that? Carter mocks John, suggesting his having hallucinations. How come Kate claims she hasn't seen any elite soldiers? Have you been implanted with Cortana for too long? Causing your mind to become confused. John stops wasting words after hearing this. Instead, he goes to find the disgraced former Navy Admiral, Parang. John shares his concerns with him. After listening, Parang gives him a launcher. Press the button and I'll find you. Meanwhile, in an underground auction house, John's friend, Soren, unexpectedly discovers a small golden-haired slave. He claims to know the whereabouts of DR, Catherine. 
Similar words have deceived Soren four times in the past six months, but he is still unwilling to give up hope of finding Catherine. So, Soren follows the small golden-haired slave to the designated location. Unfortunately, this time he is destined to return disappointed, because the small golden-haired slave is actually an undercover agent of the UNSC. In the next second, Soren is surrounded by soldiers. The ship stationed outside for extraction suddenly departs. Soren can fight, but he can't withstand the overwhelming number of enemies. The crimes of piracy, kidnapping, extortion, and treason. Soren is captured by the UNSC. On the other side, John returns to the base. He suddenly notices the Cobalt team in a standby state. Normally, since the previous mission hasn't been completed, they shouldn't be in standby mode. John suspects that something went wrong with the Cobalt team. He immediately goes to question Carter. He wants to know if the Cobalt team was attacked by the Covenant. Carter doesn't like John's attitude. He warns John that if he continues with insubordination, he doesn't mind selecting a new Master Chief. Filled with anger, John goes to the training ground to vent his frustration. Furthermore, he orders the entire Silver team to intensify their training, because John believes that the Covenant will surely launch a large-scale attack on the government. Under John's supervision, the Silver team undergoes a grueling day of training. Many of them are somewhat discontent with his approach. In order to prove his point, he plans to take the risk and find the Cobalt team, to figure out what situation they have encountered. On the other side, the long-absent Quan Ha daughter, Lucy, comes into the scene. She briskly walks among the crowd, and casually takes a wrench. Lucy hides in an empty corner. She intends to remove the slave tag from her ear. Unexpectedly, a man chases after her. He bought a batch of slaves from Spiv. The tag reader indicates that Lucy is one of them. Unable to conceal the truth, Lucy can only escape. She runs up to the second floor in one breath. She overturns the pursuer behind her. She dives into the crowd and continues to flee. Lucy doesn't dare to stop for a moment, taking advantage of her smaller size. She squeezes into a garbage processor. Then, gritting her teeth, she tears off the tag from her ear and leaves. Lucy runs back to her hiding cave. And Soren's son is also here. It seems that the two of them are still good friends. Meanwhile, Carter privately talks to Leo. He wants to find something to hold against John. Therefore, he can only investigate the people around John. However, Leo is a loyal subordinate of John's. It's impossible for him to betray his master chief. Meanwhile, John arrives at Kate's residence. He questions why she concealed the situation at the mountaintop. They were obviously attacked by Covenant elite soldiers, but Kate didn't mention a word about it. Everyone is made to not believe what John says. Kate expresses that she has her own difficulties. On that day, all of their teammates were killed by elite soldiers. She survived. Moreover, the elite soldiers withdrew on their own. If this incident is reported, there would be no way to explain it to the higher-ups. Kate just wants to protect herself. John doesn't say much. He just reminds Kate. You will regret it someday. The faces of the fallen comrades will constantly appear in your mind. John returns to the base and retrieves the flight plans of all the Spartan warriors in recent weeks. He discovers the Cobalt team's mission location. It's at the Vicegrad relay station on Reach. John immediately takes his team there to rescue the endangered Cobalt team. Meanwhile, Carter enters a secret room. The artificial intelligence Cortana appears again. It informs Carter that there is a 97% probability that the Covenant will launch an attack on Reach. Carter asks her based on the current data analysis, is there any viable strategy to prevent them from attacking Reach? Cortana's moving voice without any emotion. It states that no matter what action is taken, this probability will not change. In addition, Carter also controls DR. Catherine, from their conversation, it can be understood. Carter has a sister who was involved in the Spartan program, but she did not survive. During the time he imprisoned Catherine, he has kept a clone of his sister to accompany the doctor. And on this day, Carter brings a new companion, Soren, at the dagger base on Reach. The soldiers approach a dark corridor. Elite soldiers of the Covenant are indeed ambushed there, just as the remaining soldiers are about to be killed by the elites. A familiar voice suddenly sounds. It turns out to be Kai. She actually didn't die in the previous season. Kai commands the elite to open a side door. A runestone emitting blue light comes into view. The silver team has secretly arrived at the Vicegrad relay station. They attempt to contact the Cobalt team via radio, but there is no response from the latter. The team members look confused, because their leader deceived them, saying it was just a training exercise. John confesses, Fleet Command doesn't believe there is Covenant on reach. So, in fact, we were, acting secretly without their knowledge. So, no matter what situation we encounter later, no one will come to support us. The team members feel speechless after hearing this. But since they're already here, we can only brace ourselves and move forward. 
they search all the way to the dagger base. To their surprise, the vast building is empty. The leftover warm food on the table indicates. This place recently experienced an unexpected situation. At that moment, a strange voice is heard from the command center. John had heard it before on the top of Branta. He becomes more convinced that there are Covenant individuals here. So, they slowly approach the basement following the sound. A metal door is repeatedly opening and closing. The banging sound is coming from there. Before John and the others could go to confirm the situation, suddenly, a large wave of Marines rushes into the basement. The commanding officer in charge, citing the Silver Team's unauthorized mission, orders them to immediately drop their weapons and obediently return to the base. John refuses to let go of the opportunity in front of him and disregards the commander's orders, taking a great risk by opening the iron door. However, there is nothing behind the door and the Silver Team returns to the fleet to face punishment due to violating multiple regulations. John is suspended from duty for probation. He still refuses to accept defeat and informs the general that he has checked the flight records of the past few weeks, confirming that the Cobalt team went missing on reach. The general retrieves the flight records from four days ago, which show that the Cobalt team was assigned to execute a mission on Actis 4. John is completely dumbfounded by this revelation and hastily explains that someone must have tampered with the records. The general orders John to undergo a mental evaluation and forbids him from leaving the base until the results are obtained. Two soldiers escort John for the mental evaluation, unaware that he has quietly taken the launcher given to him by Parang. When the three of them enter the elevator together, John knocks out one of the soldiers. At this moment, Leo is unaware of the situation and still wants to plead with Carter, while Carter informs him that just 20 minutes ago, John attacked the supervising soldiers and defied orders by escaping the fleet, despite Leo believing that John must have his reasons for doing. So, doubt has begun to creep into his heart. Shortly after, the fleet discovers the bodies of the Cobalt team at a relay station 80 meters away. Their bodies are in a gruesome state, clearly caught off guard by the Covenant. To avoid leaking information, Carter conceals the news of the Cobalt team's deaths and lists them as missing. It is only then that the general realizes John's suspicions were correct and questions Carter about the concealment of the truth. Carter reveals that Cortana had already calculated the outcome, and the UNSC is aware of the situation. We simply cannot win this battle, so Command intends to abandon Reach. Essential assets being transported off the planet. I won't run. John, who escaped the base, finds Parang using the launcher, and informs her that a team of Spartan soldiers went missing during a mission, but the fleet's command pretended nothing happened. This leads John to suspect that Covenant members are likely hiding on reach. Unexpectedly, Parang's attitude abruptly changes after hearing this, and she advises John to return to the fleet early and be the obedient soldier that the higher-ups desire. Upon hearing this, John can't help but suspect that Parang never left the ONI. When John tries to leave, the people lurking around become restless. John's suspicions prove correct as Parang has indeed not left the ONI, but she doesn't give John any trouble and signals her subordinates to let him go, on the side of rubble. Since Soren's arrest, his wife Lara has taken over the affairs. Lara is walking on the street at the moment. The people around are looking at her with strange eyes. Before Lara could find the reason, she is pulled into an alley by a mysterious person. Lara is about to retaliate, but she realizes that the person is actually Lucy. Lucy reminds Lara that there is a mole among Soren's crew. If you want to stay alive, quickly take your son and flee from here. Lara returns to her residence. She sees the first mate sitting in the living room. He says that the spaceship is ready. He is waiting for Lara to act together, to rescue the imprisoned Soren. Lara remembers Lucy's reminder, so she maintains a calm demeanor on the surface. She claims that she will join them shortly, after the first mate and his people leave. Lara and her son follow Lucy and hide at the dock. There is a large gathering of refugees here. The three of them plan to steal a transport ship in the chaos. They blend into the crowd that is lining up. They successfully infiltrate the interior of the spaceship. Lara immediately sits in the pilot seat and starts the spaceship. They are about to leave the dock, but they see someone rushing to close the gate. Lara makes a quick decision and accelerates forward. Yet, the spaceship is a step too slow. The gate of the dock has already closed. Lara hands her close-fitting necklace to Lucy. Let her take her son and leave first. Then Lara walks out of the hatch to attract the first mate's attention. Lucy and the two of them take the opportunity to enter another transport ship. Meanwhile, the first mate captures Lara and takes her to the interrogation room. He claims that Soren has been unfaithful. He hid a large sum of wealth from everyone. That's why he deserves to be taken to reach. The first mate demands that Lara confess the whereabouts of the money. Lara naturally refuses to say anything. At this moment, there is a continuous knocking sound outside the cabin. 
The first mate is annoyed by the noise. He orders his subordinates to go outside and check. Then he instructs someone to throw Lara into the exhaust vent. He gives her one minute to think. Unexpectedly, the next second, blood splatters on the glass door. When Lara, who was nearly suffocating, regains consciousness, she sees Lucy. It turns out that Lucy deliberately made the noise. She also attacked and killed the first mate from behind. Lucy says that your son has already left with the transport ship. She didn't want to see Lara sacrifice herself, so she came back alone. At the same time, John finds Kate again to have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Suddenly, she hands him an earpiece. It turns out that when the Branta relay station was destroyed, she accidentally intercepted a signal. After these days, she finally decoded it. The content of the audio is a pre-war speech by the Covenant. They are about to attack Reach. The next second, the outside is filled with artillery fire. The Covenant's army has already arrived. Covenant invaders are about to attack the human colony reach. Local officials received early information. They evacuated with crucial supplies. They were willing to sacrifice the entire planet to preserve the strength of the UNSC. Meanwhile, Master Chief John and Marine Kate discovered the Covenant's invasion plan. It was already too late. Artillery fire swiftly reached reach. An interstellar war was inevitable. When John and Kate rushed into the street, beam flares were hitting like raindrops. Injured civilians scattered and fled. Kate was very worried about her family. She rushed excitedly into the street. John dragged her behind cover. The most important thing at that moment was to save their own lives. In some areas, the power was already cut off. Carter imprisoned Catherine and Soren in a secret room. It was also affected by the power outage. The idyllic holographic projection malfunctioned, revealing the true appearance of the secret room. Even the electronic lock at the door malfunctioned. Soren and Catherine easily escaped. The two of them searched for an exit within the building. Unexpectedly, they found Cortana. Little did they know, the tone of the other party was serious, urging DR Catherine to run quickly. The next second, Kai appeared and took Cortana. Behind her was an elite warrior. Soren quickly fired a few shots forward. Immediately, he pulled Catherine and ran away. On John's side, he plans to go to the fleet command headquarters to suit up. Otherwise, he won't be able to deal with the Covenant's elites. Upon hearing this, Kate finally calms down. She follows John in his actions. As the two of them enter the downtown commercial street, the people here are still unaware of what's happening. Kate shouts loudly on the street, trying to warn pedestrians to leave quickly. Little did she know, in the middle of her sentence, the pedestrians ahead suddenly fly into the air. John knows that it's the Covenant soldiers causing trouble. He sprints towards the empty space. The invisible Covenant soldier immediately appears. Kate rushes over to help as soon as she sees the situation. In the end, the two of them team up and defeat the lower-ranking soldier. They must quickly grab their equipment. John takes Kate and runs into a nearby building. After confirming there are no pursuers outside, only then do they breathe a sigh of relief. Unexpectedly, a noise suddenly comes from the adjacent room. They go over and see an old lady. In the midst of war and imminent destruction, the old lady, however, is guarding her antique shop and refuses to leave. Kate says that the Covenant wants to glass reach. These antiques and history are no longer important. You must leave here immediately. Do you understand? John understands the old lady's mindset very well. She has been guarding this pile of things on reach for 40 years. Asking the old lady to abandon this place and escape is like uprooting a big tree. Without their homeland, they cannot survive. John and Kate quickly leave the building. At this moment, the army soldiers are counter-attacking. John immediately spots his subordinate, Rees. Through their conversation, it is evident that Covenant soldiers have blocked the route to the command headquarters, so the soldiers cannot obtain their armor. In addition, the communication system has been destroyed by the enemy. Various squads are in a state of disconnection. To break through the Covenant's defense line and obtain equipment, John selects a few Marines. They plan to forcefully break through the blockade, because the Covenant's firepower is too intense. They choose to fight in the buildings along the street. Covenant soldiers have difficulty maneuvering in narrow spaces. Once inside the building, they become live targets. John and the others take advantage of the terrain. They successfully break through the blockade by traversing the buildings. Unexpectedly, as soon as they reach the street, Covenant pursuers arrive at the scene. Riz's friend, Mac, doesn't want to retreat with them. He is strapped with explosives. Without looking back, he charges towards the enemy. 
The explosion buys time for the Marines. John pulls away the heartbroken Rees. They quickly arrive at the fleet command headquarters. It is crowded with wounded and refugees. John says goodbye to Kate and takes Rees to retrieve the armor. Unexpectedly, a soldier stops them. He says the armor is long gone. It turns out that when Carter, along with senior personnel, retreated, they not only took supplies, but also took away crucial equipment of the Spartan soldiers. Only the general remained in the high command and didn't flee. Thanks to him holding the fort, the command headquarters didn't lost. John immediately goes to inquire about the situation. You know, part of me was hoping that you were dead so I wouldn't have... I don't know such luck, sir. Although he says so, deep down, the general feels guilty. He shouldn't have ignored John's warning and blindly trusted Carter. However, setting aside these grudges, the two of them must join forces to defend Reach. At this moment, the Covenant is attacking the power stations. If they manage to destroy all the power stations, the Mac array will misfire. The orbital defenses will become obsolete as well. To prevent this situation, the General is planning an ambush point. They will concentrate all their forces to defend Thermopylae. They will escort civilians onto transport ships to evacuate. Before the operation begins, the General gathers all the soldiers. He holds a mobilization meeting. He urges every soldier to be prepared to sacrifice their lives. He also reinstates John as the Master Chief. Show those scaly bastards they fucked with the wrong planet! John and the Spartan soldiers take the lead. They lead the Marines to the sniper positions. Everyone stands ready, waiting for the battle to commence. They wait for a long time, but the Covenant doesn't make a move. John senses something is amiss. He quickly orders his subordinates to fire an incendiary shell at the bridge. Indeed, under the glaring white light, a large wave of invisible Covenant soldiers is revealed. These guys actually plan to ambush. Fortunately, John noticed it in time. On the other side, Catherine and Soren finally found the command headquarters. The general is surprised to see them. Soren doesn't waste time on small talk. He asks if there's a way to leave reach. The general mentions the upper level hangar where civilian transport ships are preparing for departure. The three of them take the elevator to the upper level hangar. The civilians are busy evacuating. Soren suddenly hears a faint sound. He takes out his weapon and approaches the edge of the building. In the next second, a large number of Covenant soldiers climb onto the rooftop. Soren immediately orders the soldiers to open fire. After receiving the news of the hangar being attacked, John immediately takes a few Spartan soldiers to support them. After much effort, they manage to escort all the civilians onto the transport ship. The general, however, discovers a fuel pipeline malfunction. He entrusts the transport ship to Kate. He goes down to repair the fuel control system. Little did he know, Covenant soldiers quickly surrounded him. The general calmly repairs the system. He then initiates the self-destruct sequence, sacrificing himself alongside the Covenant. Kate suppresses her sadness and leads the civilians away. Meanwhile, John and Soren must lead the soldiers, defending the last line of defense. At a critical moment, three elite soldiers arrive. Their strength far surpasses that of ordinary Covenant. At this moment, John doesn't have his armor to protect him. He is no match for Covenant. He was about to die under the elite's blade, but Kai suddenly spoke up to stop it. John's men wanted to come to the rescue while taking advantage of the opportunity, but they were pierced by plasma bolts. A large hole exploded in their chests. John was devastated upon seeing this, but he was severely injured and could only watch as Kai and the elite departed. Although the most troublesome problem had already left, the remaining Covenant warriors continued their fierce assault. Despite Soren, John, and others resisting stubbornly, Reach orbital defenses were on the brink of collapse. More and more Covenant ships were swarming in. Suddenly, a burly brute descended from the sky, ignoring the bullets from John and the others, and came charging aggressively. Just at this critical moment, Soren's wife, Lara, arrived. She and Lucy killed the brute. Everyone dragged John and Catherine onto the ship. Unexpectedly, Rhee suddenly turned and rushed into the crossfire. It turned out she wanted to take the body of the Spartan warrior with her. John tried to stop Rhee's action, but his injuries were too severe, and he could only stare ahead. Fortunately, before long, Rhee appeared carrying her teammate, and it seemed she was about to successfully board the ship. Everyone quickly dragged Rhee into the ship. John looked at Reach outside the window. Filled with smoke, he gradually fell into a coma. When he regained consciousness, Rhees was still in danger. Catherine said she needed surgery as soon as possible, but there were no tools on the ship. John became extremely anxious upon hearing this. He considered his Spartan warriors as family, but Carter and the personnel from the command took away the warriors' equipment. They treated everyone like waste and abandoned them on reach to die. Catherine saw John's emotional distress, so she simply gave him a sedative injection. John slept for three days before regaining consciousness. Soren said they were about to land on Illyria. It was an abandoned mining outpost, 
Soren learned that his son followed a transport ship and hid on that planet. After the ship landed, John immediately took Rhys for surgery. Soren, meanwhile, took Lara to search for their son's whereabouts. They went to a local tavern to gather information. Because Soren was generous, they quickly received answers. The bar owner said that a few days ago, there was indeed a ten-year-old boy named Raven who disembarked. However, he had already been adopted by local residents. The couple breathed a sigh of relief upon hearing this. On the other hand, Lucy suggested to John, we can bury the Spartan warrior's body in the ground. Little did anyone know, John stubbornly insisted, that Spartan warriors don't need burials. We won't be buried, nor have a funeral. Upon hearing this, Lucy angrily walked away, shaking her hand. At this moment, Rees, who had just undergone surgery, finally regained consciousness. Unfortunately, the damage caused by the bomb was too severe. Even if Rees returned to the battlefield, it would be difficult for her to regain her normal combat abilities. John didn't show much concern about this. He firmly believed that Rees would endure and continue to dedicate herself to the battle. Such is the fate of a Spartan warrior. On the other side, Lucy was burying the bodies alone. She never had the chance to bury her own kin. This time, it can be considered as making up for that regret. Unexpectedly, several locals suddenly surrounded her to stop her. It turned out that on Illyria, the deceased must be cremated. The commotion attracted John's attention. The locals saw him and quickly explained that only by burning the bodies can the deceased find their own path. This idea struck a chord with John. Surprisingly, he agreed to the cremation. Shortly after, the funeral preparations were completed. Rees also came, dragging her weakened body to participate. John approached his fallen comrades who would forever sleep. I will find the ones who caused your death, and I will end them. After he finished speaking, he personally lit the bodies on fire. The blazing flames resembled John's anger. Catherine sensed his reluctance. She quickly caught up with John. She advised him not to seek revenge on the ONI alone. Doing so would be walking into death. Then Catherine confessed. In fact, John didn't initially have the qualification to become a Spartan warrior, but the Halo had an intricate connection with him. John's mission was to explore the secrets of the Halo, to help humanity find a path to survival, rather than sacrificing himself for revenge. They can't let you live. I'm already dead. At that moment during the funeral, Lucy suddenly realized that the people around her were gone. An expressionless old lady spoke. I speak for Madrigal. What did you say? This madrigal was Lucy's home planet. The old lady not only knew her hometown, but also that Lucy was the last of the Has bloodline. Lucy wanted to ask more questions, but in the next second, she returned to reality. On the other side, Soren and his wife were still on the road. They had been traveling for a whole day. They finally arrived at their son's residence place. Unexpectedly, the adoptive parents were very vigilant. They brandished their guns, ready to drive Soren away. Lara quickly explained that they were Raven's biological parents. The latter expressed that even so, you are not qualified parents. When the child arrived, he was half-starved and covered in wounds. Lara became extremely anxious upon hearing this. Soren quickly calmed his wife down. He persuaded the adoptive parents. Lara immediately rushed towards her son, but when she took off the helmet and looked, the little boy wasn't Raven at all. It turned out that Raven, due to hunger, had exchanged the helmet for food. Soren and his wife completely lost the lead. Fortunately, Lara didn't give up hope. She returned to the bar and used threats and bribes on the owner, finally extracting information about Raven's whereabouts. He was taken away by personnel from the United Nations Space Command. The couple immediately set off. John also wanted to go to the command center for revenge, so he prepared to take Rees with him and depart. But the latter felt exhausted. Rees wanted to stay on this planet, to break free from the shackles of being a warrior. John chose to respect Rees's decision. Without looking back, he entered the spacecraft. Little did he know, his most trusted subordinate, Leo, had been appointed as the new master chief by the command center. A Spartan team is approaching a Covenant warship. As soon as the enemy detects their movement, they immediately launch a barrage of firepower. Team member Kate suffers consecutive impacts. She struggles to stabilize herself, and then successfully lands with the team. Kate immediately proceeds to execute the second phase of the mission, using a bomb to blow open the pathway into the enemy ship. The Spartan soldier's mission is to infiltrate the vessel and use a virus-infected spike to destroy the bridge. The bridge serves as the central nervous system. Once infected by the virus, the entire enemy ship's systems will shut down completely. Both sides have similar firepower. After a fierce battle, with the cover of her teammates, Kate enters the command center. Just as she is about to destroy the control console, she is shot from behind by a sniper rifle. The next moment, Kate is back in reality. It turns out it was just a simulated training session. Leo becomes the new master chief and receives orders from Carter. 
to train a new batch of Spartan warriors for the government. So the Marine members, including Kate, kept undergoing simulated training. Leo is dissatisfied with the results of this training, because the Marines level is far below that of the Spartan warriors. She is making a training summary, while Kate, who is beside her, chuckles, because all the Spartan warriors are fighting on reach. Only Leo left with Carter, so she is not convinced by the other side's discipline. In fact, Leo has been brainwashed by Carter. She mistakenly believed that Master Chief had died on reach, so she took responsibility for him. The Marine members are far behind. Not a single recruit survived in the Corvette simulation. I can't turn them into Spartans. They are Spartans. And it's your job to make them believe it. Leo can only continue with simulated training for the Marines. This time, the members summarize their experiences and make steady progress. Although several members are still lost during the process. But in the end, Kate manages to insert the spike into the control console. The Marines can't believe the mission is successful. They wake up and cheer. But Kate sensitively realizes that. After inserting the spike into the system, the Covenant enemies have also disappeared. The difficulty of this simulation has clearly decreased. She immediately goes to report to Leo. On the other side, Admiral Parang is having a conversation with Carter. Less than an hour ago, a spacecraft invaded their airspace. Parang suspects it's John coming after them. Her guess turns out to be correct. At this moment, John, the Soren couple, and Dr. Catherine, along with Lucy, are in the nearby woods, not far from the base. The Soren couple plans to separate from John, to search for their captured son, Raven. Unexpectedly, Lucy, who is conducting reconnaissance nearby, discovers the presence of the Marine team. John immediately rushes over upon hearing the sound. Even without his armor, his abilities surpass those of the Marines. John quickly eliminates the small team, but more Marine members swarm in. She sees a mysterious old woman in a red robe. This person is the priestess who spoke to Lucy at the Spartan warrior's funeral. Lucy chases after the old woman. She accidentally falls into a deep well. To her surprise, Dr. Catherine is also in the well. She seems familiar with this place. What is this place? It's where it all began. Catherine leads Lucy into the hidden base inside the well. Her daughter, Miranda, is present here, leading a team of researchers to study the ancient artifacts. Meanwhile, John deliberately gets captured. He enters the base with the Marines. The soldiers have all heard of the name Master Chief, so they are on high alert. They chain him up with iron chains. John provokes by looking defiantly at the surveillance cameras. Unbeknownst to him, Carter uses this footage to deceive Leo. He claims that even the command didn't know John was still alive, and suggests that John might be colluding with Kai. Only then did he survive from the Battle of Reach. Now, John is attacking the soldiers at the Space Command for a reason, but Leo firmly believes that Master Chief would never collude with the Covenant. Carter changes his tone upon hearing Leo's words. He explains that the Covenant attacked the relay station earlier to seize the Keystone. Fortunately, the Command has already relocated another piece. Now, the Keystone number one is hidden here. Carter demands that, no matter the cost, Leo must protect the Keystone. He cannot let it fall into Master Chief's hands. Soon, John stands before Leo. He tries to explain why Reach fell was due to Carter and the higher-ups abandoned resistance. If they hadn't taken away the power armor, Reese would not have injured her spine. But Leo, being a Spartan warrior at heart, follows orders. Leo puts on her helmet and unleashes a brutal beating on John, showing no mercy despite he is Master Chief. Leo's inner conflict is intense. In the end, she only knocks John unconscious and leaves him behind. Immediately, Leo goes to find Carter. She asks him why he lowered the difficulty of the simulation training. Carter explains that the Marines must win at least once, so they can have hope of victory in real combat. Don't those soldiers deserve hope too? And what did you give the people on reach? John said that you left him here for dead, without his armor. Carter cannot refute her words. He says sacrifices are inevitable. Leo finally leaves Carter behind. On the other side, Elite Captain Arbiter is confused by the halo visions presented by Kai, so he changes the fleet's course. This raises suspicion from the Covenant priests. It even considers killing Kai, but Elite Captain stops it, because he still needs Kai to communicate with the Keystone. At this moment, Elite Captain is unaware that Kai has already lost the ability to access the Keystone, because her connection with John is lost. Only the observant Cortana notices this. She offers her help. Cortana just needs to enter the Covenant ship's transmission array to find John's whereabouts and restore their connection. Reluctantly, Kai agrees. After Cortana enters the transmission array, she sends an encrypted signal to the Space Command Center. Then she finds the beaten and half-dead John. 
She tells him that the Covenant is searching for Halo, and he must act before the enemy. Furthermore, Arbiter, the one who killed Black Man, is on the ship. Upon hearing the enemy's name, John becomes determined, but he doesn't know what to do next. That's why you have me. After Cortana finishes speaking, she opens the electronic lock, ensuring a clear path for John. The Marines are all locked behind the door by Cortana. The final iron door opens quickly. John stands before the keystone. On the other side, Kai's infiltration of the transmission array is exposed. The priest demands that Arbiter immediately execute her. Arbiter raises his sword to Kai upon hearing this. It seems that Arbiter intends to defy the Covenant orders and search for Halo alone. Taking advantage of the chaos, Kai crawls towards the keystone. Meanwhile, John also stands in front of the command center's keystone. The two instantly sense each other's presence. John and Kai enter Halo once again. Former lovers finally reunite after great difficulty. Kai immediately grabs John's hands. She tells him that Halo's purpose is not just destruction. It nurtures the seeds of life. Instead of letting it fall into the hands of humans or the Covenant, why don't we use Halo to build a brand new world? Before John can respond, a Covenant warrior suddenly appears behind Kai and there are also marines approaching from behind him. In the next second, the two are bounced back to the real world. The keystone erupts with immense energy. The base in the deep well is also affected. Meanwhile, the internal struggle within the Covenant continues. Kai hurriedly carries Cortana and escapes. The priest chases after upon seeing this. Little did he know, Kai disappears in an instant. Instead, Cortana appears. She attracts the priest's attention using the Covenant language. Kai takes the opportunity to launch a surprise attack from behind and stabs the priest to death. Immediately after, Kai unfolds the star map, successfully locates the position of Halo. Meanwhile, at the space headquarters, based on the encrypted signal transmitted by Cortana, they successfully track the Covenant cruiser's whereabouts, discovering that they have deployed the first fleet, which is stationed in the Soul system. Parang speculates that Halo must be near that star system, so he orders Carter to prepare the third-generation Spartan warriors. Carter is taken aback by this. The third-generation Spartans have just received training, sending them to confront the Covenant First Fleet. Isn't that the same as sending them to their deaths? But the orders have already been given by higher-ups. Carter can only comply. Meanwhile, John is following Cortana's instructions, continuing towards the depths of the command center base. Unexpectedly, a group of Marines blocks their path. The leader with short hair orders them to shoot and kill John. But the soldiers hesitate to harm Master Chief, and they all disobey the order and flee. The leader with short hair intends to take matters into his own hands, but is knocked unconscious by Leo's punch. Didn't ask for your help. It seems John hasn't forgiven him yet. As the scene shifts, we arrive at the depths of the well. Through the conversation between Miranda and Lucy, it is revealed that the person who designed this monument built Halo. Catherine spent for months to open the first niche. With Miranda's research and Catherine's notes, they successfully opened the stone slab in front of the monument. Inside, it likely holds the genes of the forerunners and humans. In addition, Miranda found a disc, which could be some kind of key. She hasn't found its usage yet. Just then, the stones in front of Lucy suddenly glow. She carefully takes off the glowing stones, and a set of star maps unfolds before her eyes. Lucy had seen a similar pattern in a cave on Madrigal. She puts the glowing stones back in their positions. A circular ring appears in mid-air. It fits into the groove, opening the mysterious stone door. The three of them immediately enter. A glowing bridge unfolds before their eyes. At the end of the bridge is another door. Catherine inserts the disc into the door. Behind the door, there's a laboratory, and the body of a forerunner lies on the ground. It tightly holds a piece of stone in its hands. Catherine tries to take the stone, but the entire structure starts to shake. The three of them have to leave the laboratory. The light bridge beneath their feet is disappearing. Halfway through, Catherine sees a city below the bridge. She freezes in place. Miranda says, Mom and successfully brings Catherine back to her senses. The three of them make it back to the deep well just in time. Meanwhile, the star map above continues to change. It's expanding continuously. Lucy, not knowing what she remembers, turns and walks into the darkness. Catherine stops her daughter, who was about to chase after, and asks if Miranda has taken that piece of stone. Upon hearing this, Miranda takes out the mysterious stone. In the space command center on the other side, the first team sent by Parang just lost contact with headquarters as they approached the Covenant. But Parang immediately arranges the second and third teams to take over. Carter doesn't understand the purpose of this suicide attack. 
so he quietly enters the control room with a spike carrying a virus. He inputs the parameters on the spike. To his surprise, the spike doesn't override the system. The virus will compress the fusion engines of the ship, causing an explosion powerful enough to destroy the entire galaxy. At that time, both the command center fleet and the covenant fleet, even Halo itself will be destroyed. It turns out that Parang was prepared to sacrifice everything. Carter leaves the control room with mixed feelings, and unexpectedly runs into John and Leo. John intends to strangle Carter upon encountering him, but only he knows the location of the armor. So John spares Carter's life, and asks him to lead the way to the armor. During their journey, Carter defends himself. That abandoning reach was actually Admiral Parang's order. To prove that he's telling the truth, Carter reveals Parang's spike plan in detail. John had to reluctantly agree with Parang's actions. Even if it meant sacrificing all Spartan warriors, he couldn't let the Covenant find Halo. Otherwise, it would mean the destruction of the entire human race. As for how to deal with Carter, John demanded that he publicly confess his actions on Reach, and be held accountable for the deaths of those who perished. Shortly after, Leo decided to stay behind, and personally guide the third generation of Spartans to complete the mission. She couldn't let these warriors face destruction alone. Meanwhile, John had his own mission to fulfill. He put on his armor and prepared to leave, but to his surprise, he encountered Kate, who was preparing to carry out the spike mission. Seeing Master Chief still alive now gave Kate a renewed spirit. She bid farewell to Master Chief and joined Leo. Meanwhile, John piloted a spacecraft and approached the Covenant fleet. The battle for survival was finally about to begin. First flight, on the beam. John looked at the vast and infinite starry sky and saw a faintly glowing ring. On the other side, the Soren couple finally found Raven's whereabouts. It turned out he had been captured and taken to the Spartan training camp. Lara would never let her son become a fighting machine. So together with Soren, they rescued Raven. However, the young boy had his memories wiped clean and couldn't recognize his parents for a moment. Meanwhile, Miranda opened the stone. She discovers dormant spores within the stone. Miranda hasn't figured out what it is. Researcher Jenny in the laboratory observes the stone through a glass enclosure. Miranda reminds her not to touch anything inside. Jenny feels a bit guilty and after leaving the lab, she starts sweating profusely and veins appear on her neck. The next moment, Jenny stabs her colleague with a pen. It must be related to the spores inside the stone. The group locks Jenny up in prison, right next to Carter and Lara and her son. It turns out that after Lara and Soren found their son, they were captured by the Marines. Jenny, with a vacant look in her eyes, has a peculiarly shaped worm crawling out of her mouth. Leo is leading the squad on a mission, and before they can leave the spaceship, they are hit by a shell. Kate and the others panic. But fortunately, Leo commands everyone to stay steady. They successfully infiltrate the Covenant enemy ship, and as soon as they enter, they see a pile of corpses. These are the fallen three generations of Spartans, and Leo leads everyone forward cautiously. Unexpectedly, they encounter Covenant warriors around the corner. It turns out the Covenant soldiers were waiting for them, facing with the increasingly strong firepower of the enemy. These newly deployed temporary Spartans quickly lose their composure. At that moment, the fleet from the United Nations Space Command approaches, and Leo requests support from them, just as they were about to send reinforcements upon hearing the signal. The Covenant warship strikes. John sees the situation and wants to come and support Leo, but Parang asks him to go to the interior of Halo first, because if the Covenant reaches Halo first, the sacrifice of the three generations of Spartans would be in vain. Parang also brings Catherine to persuade him. John won't ignore it. He still decides to go back and rescue Leo. Meanwhile, Kai's fleet is about to reach the interior of Halo. Kai knows Cortana is very loyal to John, and keeping her by his side would be like planting a time bomb. So Kai crushes Cortana's vehicle. On the other side, the Spartan team is in bad shape, and even Kate is injured by the enemy. After settling Kate, Leo takes out the spike in her hand. Once activated, it will cause the entire galaxy to explode to prevent the efforts of the Spartan warriors from going to waste. Leo decides to end it all. Suddenly, there are explosions, and the cries of Covenant soldiers outside the door. Leo knows that John has returned, and Master Chief quickly resolved the Covenant soldiers. He tells Leo to quickly evacuate the wounded and gives instructions, and then John immediately flies towards Kai's ship. Catherine reminds him that the ship is being pulled into Halo's gravity, and will soon disintegrate, and the people inside have already evacuated. John knows the situation inside the ship, and he takes the risk to find Cortana. However, the ground vehicle is already malfunctioning, and just when John thinks Cortana is gone, the voice of the other party suddenly sounds. 
Cortana has hidden in the spaceship system, and she urges John to leave immediately, because she has simulated all possible outcomes. She calculated the result that humanity will inevitably be destroyed. Cortana. Or... You don't know everything. John punches the control panel. Cortana follows the current and re-enters his armor. The spaceship disintegrates completely under the influence of gravity. When John regains consciousness, he has already fallen into Halo. Everything around is vibrant, a perfect fusion of artificial intelligence and organic life. Cortana guides John to the temple, while Arbiter and Kai are also heading towards that building. On the other side, Soren and Lucy venture into the command center to save Lara and her child. The people inside are all frozen in place, and they show no response. What is going on? The two continue forward, but at this moment, Jenny starts to mutate. Disgusting tumors grow on her neck, and a thick tentacle bursts out of her body. Carter quickly shoots and kills it, but soon another person gets infected. Carter's hidden pistol is out of ammunition. Soren and Lucy see the situation through the surveillance, and rush to the scene to rescue Lara and her child. Carter saves Soren's wife, and Soren helps him open the cell door. Carter, familiar with the base, leads the three of them. On the other side, Kate has moved to a safe location. When she wakes up, she realizes the captain is not by her side. It turns out Leo stayed on the Covenant frigate, and she steers the warship to collide with the Covenant assault carrier. Leo sacrifice one once for the command center, and a massive explosion unfolds before their eyes. Everyone's mood is very heavy. At this moment, Miranda contacts Catherine. She explains that the stone is a sample container, and the contents inside are not dormant spores at all, but some kind of ancient parasite. As soon as she finishes speaking, Catherine notices that the employees around her are acting strangely. A man rushes over and tackles Catherine. While the parasite thrashes in his mouth, Catherine takes advantage of the chaos and pushes the man away, then runs outside to close the door. The parasite rapidly spreads through biting. Parang is tackled by several infected individuals, and Catherine hurries to the laboratory to find Miranda. She is pleased to see her daughter's report. These spores have the ability to self-replicate, and will be activated once they come into contact with living tissue. Miranda doesn't understand why her mother is excited. This is a biological disaster. She was about to argue with Catherine, when she notices that Catherine has stopped moving. Miranda pulls back her mother's hair, and discovers a wound on her neck. It turns out Catherine has already been infected. Miranda can only place her in a cryogenic pod to temporarily slow down the infection rate. Meanwhile, Soren and the others are surrounded by infected individuals. Soren focuses on protecting his family. He can't take care of Lucy, as she is already surrounded by infected individuals. The mysterious old woman appears again and immobilizes the infected individuals around her. Lucy asks her what is going on with these people. This is the Flood. The Flood is actually a powerful race created by the Forerunners in the Halo universe. With the help of the old woman, Lucy manages to escape and reunite with Soren and the others. Lara locks herself behind a door as she has been infected during the escape. She can't stay with her family any longer. Inside Halo, John catches up with Kai and the Arbiter, who killed the Spartan, is right in front of him. A great battle is inevitable. Both sides are evenly matched. In the end, John, with a slight advantage, manages to kill the Arbiter and avenge his teammate. Taking advantage of the situation, Kai activates the temple. The two enter the dark interior of the temple. John comes face to face with a guide, an artificial intelligence. The guide tells John, I knew you would come. You are here because it is awake. It's been down there all this time, waiting. This season ends here. The biggest highlight of the second season is the introduction of the core boss, the Flood. The Flood is a highly infectious organism that can infect any sentient being. Its collective can merge into a grave mind, possessing consciousness and intelligence. The mysterious old woman who rescued Lucy is likely an ancestor from their family. She can control the infected beings with her will. It can be said that the entire Halo Chronicle revolves around the Flood. Humans and the Covenant are merely minor players in its presence. So it seems that the third season will be the essence of this series. If you enjoy my channel, please consider subscribing.